Hello Fanatics! Welcome to Diamond Potent Fanatics. I am Cindy and here we are. It is Thursday and you know what that means. True crime episode. If you are new here, hello. I talk about a true crime uh, while doing my diamond painting and I have been roped back in. I have been asked to do more of them, which is amazing and I'm loving it. I was looking into a new episode and I suddenly thought, I haven't put a disclaimer on my video. So please, viewer discretion is advised because some of the people that we talk about are very sick individuals that do atrocious acts of violence and murder and rape and vile human beings. Nine times out of ten, they get their comeuppance. They get sent to jail. Sometimes they don't. So the next story that I looked into, I suddenly thought I need to update my introduction to my videos and you get to see me again so it's not all bad thank you so much for joining me if you'd be so kind if you do enjoy my youtube channel uh, my true crime my spiritual so far my unboxings anything hit that subscribe button i would love to have you on my journey with me thank you so much for joining me on my true crime journey I'm loving it and I hope you guys are too. Can I just quickly say, because we talk about a wide range of subject areas, um, I personally myself have been abused for many, many years. If I trigger anything, please don't sit on your own. Please seek help. With that said, let's move on to another depraved individual and find out what they've done this week. Who's it going to be? Stay tuned to find out. Bye. Stay safe out there. Today I am working on my colourful flowers from Spell Queen, but this week I stumbled upon this case and it shocked me to the core. Today we're going to talk about Shirley Jane Turner. She was born on the 28th of January in 1961. She was a daughter of a U.S. serviceman and a local woman from St. Anthony in Newfoundland. She was raised with three siblings in Kansas, but moved to Newfoundland with her mother after her parents separated. Her parents later divorced, and in 1980, Shirley enrolled at Memorial University of Foundland in St. John's, seeking to embark on a medical career. Sounds awesome. Dedicated and yeah. Upon becoming pregnant, Shirley married long-term boyfriend during Memorial University's 1981 winter recess. The child was a boy and was born on the 9th of July, 1982. Shirley's husband raised the child as a stay-at-home dad while Shirley continued her studies. In 1983, Shirley moved to Labrador City and worked as a science teacher. Two years later, she gave birth to a daughter. During this period, she resumed a previous relationship 
with a fisherman from Corner Brook. It was going so well. Following the end of her first marriage on July, uh, on January the 29th in 1988, Shirley married her boyfriend from Corner Brook the following July. Shirley had an abortion that July, but the father was not known. Shirley gave birth to her second daughter on the 8th of March in 1990, one year before she and her second husband separated. Shirley completed her undergraduate education while raising her children with help from her second husband. In October 1993, a man boarding with Shirley confided to his therapist that he had witnessed Shirley physically and emotionally abusing two of her children. Newfoundland social service workers interviewed the children who stated that their, quote, disciplinarian mother punished them with spankings and beatings by belt. Shirley's second husband claimed that she only used the belt as a threat in his interview. The case was closed on the 11th of January in 1994 without an interview with Shirley. Bed flag number one. Three years later, Shirley and her second husband divorced and she was granted custody of their daughter. Yeah, one. Within days of the ruling, however, Shirley sent her daughter back to live with her father in Portland Creek, while her other two children were sent to Parsons Pond to live with their paternal grandmother. Where did it all go wrong? Since 1982, Shirley had taken out baby bonuses for her children from a scholarship fund with the expectation of sending them to university. However, in the summer of 2000, Shirley confessed to a relative that she had spent the baby bonuses on her own living expenses as well as her doctoral education. Shirley insisted that she would, quote, earn big money after completing her post-residency training and would repay the savings for her children's post-secondary education. Shirley received her undergraduate degree from Memorial University in May 1994. Four years later, she earned her medical degree between 1998 and 2000, she served as a resident doctor um, at teaching hospitals across Newfoundland. During a 1999 residency at a family practice in St John's, Shirley's professionalism drew harsh criticism by her supervisor, who stated she would become, quote, quite hostile, yelling, crying and accusing me of treating her unfairly. During her second residency period in early 2000, Shirley missed nine days of her three-month rotation and falsified clinical reports. A patient of the clinic refused to return after an encounter with Shirley. The staff became quote, so concerned about Shirley Turner's approach to confrontation and the truth that we would never give her feedback or hold any major discussion with her alone. These incidents left the supervisor with the impression that, quote, I felt I was being manipulated whenever I spoke with Shirley Turner. When negative items would come up, she would change the topic to one of my failings. She could be charming, friendly 
and lively, but when caught in an untruth, she would become angry, accuse, and loud. I always felt Shirley Turner was putting on a show, as if she were playing the role, but had no feeling for her work. I cannot recall a trainee like Shirley Turner in that her approach lacked personal commitment. Her relationships with people seemed, at least to me, to be superficial when compared to over the 400 residents I have supervised during the past 21 years. Now, what screams out to me personally is that we're dealing with a narcissist because they won't take any responsibility. They are charming, friendly and lively, but when you're questioning them, they become hostile and gaslight. And we all know how narcissists work, but from that statement, just from the supervisor, I can tell you she's narcissistic. Okay, carrying on. In a later interview with the assessment officer at the Office of the Child and Youth Advocate, the supervisor, in hindsight, described Shirley as, quote, a manipulative, guiltless psychopath. That might actually be more accurate. The experience with Shirley led that St John's practice to make quote, constructive changes in its residency evaluation process. By the summer of 2000, Shirley had completed the requirements of her residency training and was qualified to practice medicine. In March 1996, Shirley began a relationship with a St John's resident who was 13 years her junior. After the man broke up with Shirley and moved elsewhere in Newfoundland, she began inundating him with phone calls. In November 1997, Shirley confronted him in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and struck him in the jaw with her high-heeled shoe. After consulting with his parents, the man moved to West Town township in Pennsylvania in 1998. However, Shirley followed the man to Pennsylvania, leaving leaving threatening voicemails over the following year and making unannounced visits to his apartment. On several occasions, he had summoned state troopers to order her to leave. He He expressed fear to the police of quote, what Dr Turner would do next. On the 7th of April 1999, the man found Shirley laying semi-conscious outside of his apartment. She had ingested a combined 65 milligrams of over-the-counter drugs in a suicide attempt. Shirley was wearing a black dress, carrying a bouquet of red roses and had two suicide notes on her. One note had been addressed to the man and the other to her psychiatrist. The latter read, quote, I'm not evil, just sick. Shirley was rushed to the hospital where she received a gastric lavage. The following day, the man received a voicemail from a female caller who stated, Dr. Turner died last night. Beginning in early 1999, Shirley began dating Andrew David Bagby, an American medical student studying at Memorial University for his third year. Andrew came from... Sunnyvale in California and was the son of Kathleen and David. So Kathleen is a registered nurse and a midwife uh, from England and David was uh, an American former US Navy serviceman and computer engineer. In August 2000 Shirley moved to Iowa to begin work for 
Trimark Corporation. Meanwhile, after graduating from Memorial University in May 2000, Andrew landed a surgical residency at the State University on New York Upstate Medical University at Santa Cruz, New York. Despite the distance between the states, Shirley and Andrew initially tried to maintain a long-distance relationship. By Shirley's account, she visited Andrew's residence in Santa Cruz seven times while he visited her once in Iowa. During one of these visits, Shirley believe, is believed to have burglarised Andrew's apartment. In the fall of 2001, Andrew moved to Pennsylvania and began his residency at a family practice under the supervision of Dr. T. Clark Simpson. On the 10th of July 2001, less than a year into her 10-year contract with Trimark, Shirley left their clinic and moved to Council Bluffs in Iowa, where she was hired by um, Allergent Health System of Omar, Nebraska. In 2001, Shirley obtained a permit to buy a firearm and purchased a Phoenix Arms HP-22 handgun and a .20, and .22 ammunition, which she used during firearms lessons. Meanwhile, Shirley exhibited possessive behaviour towards Andrew and harassed him over the phone. On the 13th of October, you can see where this is going, can't you? On the 13th of October, Shirley told Andrew that she was three months pregnant. Andrew agreed to talk with her about the baby during a wedding that... Andrew was scheduled to attend. When Shirley visited him in late October 2001, immediately after the last of her firearms lessons, the two frequently argued over his relationship with a new girlfriend. On the 3rd of November 2001, Shirley confessed that she had been lying about her pregnancy in an effort to remain with Andrew permanently. Furious about this, Andrew drove Shirley to the uh, Arnold Palmer Regional Airport, broke up with her over lunch, sending her on a plane back to Iowa. Good job, dude. Good job. On the 4th of November 2001, Shirley made a total of three phone calls to Andrew's residence. At approximately 1pm local time, Shirley embarked on a 16 hour, which is 946 miles. She drove to where he was, Pennsylvania, uh, with her gun and ammunition inside a gun box in her Toyota in the early morning of the 5th of November 2001, she confronted Andrew at his residence, located across the street from his practice. Andrew arrived at work in an agitated state and told Simpson, which was his, who was Simpson, his supervisor, about her, about her turning up, but dismissed his advice not to meet with her in private. Andrew subsequently promised to visit uh, the supervisor's house after he had finished talking to Shirley that evening. He never showed up. Shirley later drove home and left a message on, uh, on Andrew's answering machine. The following morning, Andrew's body was found in a day-use parking lot at Keys. Keystone State Park in Derry Township in Pennsylvania. He had been shot five times in the face, the chest, the buttocks 
and the back of the head with 0.22 bullets. Acting on statements by the supervisor, Simpson, and others, the Pennsylvania State Police contacted Shirley. Despite her claim to have been in bed sick on November the 5th, cell phone and internet records showed that she had made cross-country calls both to and from Pennsylvania, accessed eBay and Hotmail from Andrew's home computer and used his home phone to call in sick. When confronted with this evidence, Shirley claimed that she met with Andrew at Keystone State Park, but that the gun was in his truck. Shirley alternatively told her shooting instructor that her gun had been stolen. Investigators interviewed Shirley's shooting instructor, who explained that her handgun ejected live rounds during lessons. This was consistent with an unspent round recovered near Andrew's body. Later, a Derry resident travelling through the park reported seeing Andrew's Toyota Corolla parked next to Shirley's Toyota RAV4 10 minutes after Andrew made his last phone call to Supervisor Simpson. The resident saw a, the Corolla parked alone the following morning. The lot number on a box of condoms found in Shirley's Council Buff's apartment matched a box purchased by Andrew on the night of the breakup. So she took his condoms. <sighs> also in. Shirley's apartment were MapQuest printouts for road directions to Pennsylvania. Despite the evidence gathered, Shirley had fled the country by the time the authorities obtained a warrant for her arrest. This is just the beginning. On the 12th of November 2001, Shirley abandoned her residence in Council Bluffs and flew to Toronto eventually resettling in St John's with her eldest son. Acting in collaboration with the Pennsylvania State Police, the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary's Intelligence Unit conducted surveillance on her movements. On the 2nd of December, the unit seized her trash and discovered printouts for an ultrasound taken on the 29th of November, showing a fetus that was conceived with Andrew the previous month. So she lied about the pregnancy, but she was pregnant with Andrew's child. The RNC, which is the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary, arrested Shirley on the 12th of December. The same day, extradition proceedings commenced against her. However, Newfoundland Justice Gail Welsh believed Shirley wasn't a threat to society despite the murder charges awaiting for her in Pennsylvania. In exchange for her freedom, Shirley was required to post a 75,000, I believe that's Canadian dollars, bail turn in her passports, pay weekly visits to the RNC, promise not to leave the area and make no attempt to contact Andrew's family. Shirley posted bail with the help from her psychiatrist. I mean, I wouldn't dream of phoning up my therapist. I'm not in therapy anymore, but I wouldn't dream of phoning up my therapist and saying, oh, can you just, like, lend me some money to, you know, get bail? A former co-worker, there you go, I, I would not have done it, but that's me. So they don't think she's a risk to the public because they think that her main objective was to just kill her boyfriend, which she had done. So she's out on bail, um, not a flight risk, and they've kind of forgotten that she's already 
flown to Toronto at some point. Yeah, I'm getting annoyed. The news that Shirley was pregnant with Andrew's child turned the extradition case into one involving child custody and subsequently led to a complicated legal saga. David and Kathleen, Andrew's parents, moved to St John's, Newfoundland in order to fight for custody for their son's child while Shirley eventually moved into her own apartment on Pleasant Street in St John's. Zach was, or Zachary was born on the 18th of July 2002. Shirley persistently refused to allow David and Kathleen to see their grandson, fearing they would kidnap him. She's not paranoid there, is she? she? Oh, she went so far. She discharged her family law lawyer because of his positive attitude towards uh, David and Kathleen. He was trying to work out a deal and, and keep the peace, but that doesn't, doesn't work for the narcissist slash psychopath. On several occasions, it was noted that Zachary had poor attachment to his mother and preferred the company of other adults, particularly his grandparents. This pres preference was made especially clear during Zachary's first birthday party at a St John's McDonald's, after which Shirley said to Kathleen, quote, he obviously loves you more than me, so why don't you take him? Shirley was returned to jail in November 2002, pending a decision by the Federal Justice Minister regarding whether she should be extradited to the United States. However, in January 2003, Justice Welsh again released her, arguing that the murder quote, was not directed at the public at large and that Turner was presumed to be innocent. Can you believe that? Thanks to his decision, the following happened. On the 4th of July 2003, Shirley met a young man at a bar in St John's. The pair dated and were intimate on two occasions afterwards. The man then broke off the relationship after learning from a friend about Shirley's connection to Andrew's murder. Shirley subsequently made a total of 200 threatening phone calls to the man over the following month. Shirley claimed that she was pregnant by the man but no evidence was found showing this to be the case worked last time. The man contacted the RNC, the Newfoundland police, on three occasions to complain about Shirley's harassment, which both violated the terms of her bail and was considered grounds to lose custody of Zachary. Unfortunately, because the man didn't identify himself and declined to file any criminal complaint against Shirley, no investigation was launched by the RNC. When a constable contacted Shirley's lawyer about the harassment, she denied all allegations, even though she has phone records. I, I mean, this is driving me nuts. On the 18th of August 2003, Zachary, the the baby, was scheduled to be in his mother's custody. Shirley, Shirley first purchased her prescription of lorazepam from St John's Pharmacy. She then drove with Zachary to a nearby Con Conception Bay South where the man she had met at the bar lived. Shirley left her car parked near his home in the Kelly Grooves area of the town 
with photographs of herself and Zachary as well as a used tampon on the front seat. Ew. Police concluded that she was attempting to frame the boyfriend for the planned murder suicide. After mixing her lorazepam into Zachary's baby formula and ingesting a toxic dosage herself, Shirley strapped the infant to her chest with her sweater and jumped off a fishing wharf at Fox Trap Marina into the Atlantic Ocean. Shirley drowned. It was determined that Zachary was rendered unconscious by the lorazepam and did not suffer. Shirley's body was found on a beach by a, a couple on holiday with Zachary's body discovered nearby. On the 3rd of May 2006, a, displ- a disciplinary board convened by the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Newfoundland and Labrador found Dowsett guilty of professional misconduct for his involvement in helping to post Shirley's $75,000 bail. He was ordered to pay a fine of $10,000, covering one-third of the $30,000 incurred by the college for the inquiry and was ordered to undergo psychiatric counselling. Dowsett said, quote, he was disappointed by the verdict. While David Bagby, which is Andrew's dad, stated that he was happy with the he was happy with the way the case was going. According to filmmaker Kurt something I can't pronounce, we'll just call him Kurt. Dowsett later left Newfoundland and relocated elsewhere in Canada. In October 2006, Winnipeg-based coroner Peter released the Turner Review and Investigation, which concluded that Zachary's death was preventable and criticised Newfoundland and Labrador's social service system for failing to protect the child from his mother, stating, quote, Nowhere did I find any ongoing assessment of the safety needs of the children. Peter specifically cited poor communication between social services officials who worked on the presumption of Shirley's innocence throughout the case and became more concerned for her welfare than for Zachary's. Peter ultimately concluded that the internal disagreements between the caseworkers and the managers weren't openly discussed and that an an intervention by an outside office should have been made. The provincial government of Newfoundland and Labrador accepted the report's conclusions and its 29 recommendations. On October the 23rd, 2009, Scott Andrews, then a Liberal MP from Newfoundland and Labrador, introduced Zachary's bill, which would change the criminal code of Canada to allow the courts to justify their refusing bail to those accused of serious crimes in the name of protecting their children. The bill received a unanimous support in the Canadian House of Commons and received support from Liberal Senator Tommy Banks. It was finally signed into law by Governor General David Johnston on the 16th of December 2010. Andrews later said that the law, quote, gives the Bagbys some sense 
that someone has heard their cries so this will not happen again. To change the law to make something this tragic will never happen again. David Bagby penned a book about the case titled Dance with the Devil, A Memoir of Murder and Loss. It was published in 2007. It's really, really tragic. And whether you're calling her a psychopath or a narcissist, parental narcissists, I I was brought up by one, um... The one should not have let her out. She was being charged with murder. So if you just murder your boyfriend, you're free to just roam the streets then. Whereas if I just open fire outside now to the guys walking past my window, I'm suddenly a threat to the public. It doesn't make any sense. She should have been locked up. And the the... Poor parents, they lost their son and then their grandson. And they would, they did everything. They sold their house and um, filed for custody. They did everything. They knew that baby needed them. And she never faced up to her crimes or the harassment or any of it. So that is the disgusting case of... Shirley Turner. Yeah, this annoyed me, I have to say. Um, It's so very, very, very tragic. He was one years old. Just had his first birthday. But at least they brought in Zachary's bill. So that hopefully that never happens again. I have a question for you guys. And please feel free to use the comments and give me your thoughts on this case. If this had been a man who shot his girlfriend, they would be in jail. I think there is still society misconception that women can't be as dangerous. Andrew should never have lost his life. It's just it, the whole case... It's just so very tragic and I believe that without doubt the social services and the police let Zachary down. Thank you for joining me and my heart goes out to the Bagbies on every level. And quite recent too, it's in the 90s um, or 2000s, 2003, yeah. Thank you for joining me and keeping me company and I shall see you in another Thriller Thursday very, very soon. Hug your kids and everyone keep safe. Love, hugs and sparkles to you all. Bye.